everyone. Uh, already been introduced. So I'm, be, I'm going to be talking about Ecosphere. It's a social enterprise and our initiatives in the Himalayas in the region called Spiti Valley. I'll try and make it as exciting and interesting and nail-bitingly interesting. It's a different matter. I have no nails left just on this journey from here to there. But uh, I'd like to start with a short story, a uh, story that I like. And uh, it's about a bull and a pheasant. And they were great friends, and they had a great partnership going. You know, the bull would eat the grass and the ground. The pheasant would sit on the bull's back and eat the fleas off the back of the bull. So one day, in a melancholic mood, the, the pheasant tells the bull, you know, I've become so old. When I was young, I could fly to the top of that, the, the topmost branch of that tree. Now I can't even get to the first branch. So the bull sympathetically tells him, hey, don't worry, I've got a solution. So he says, what? He said, just eat a little bit of my dung every day you'll get to the topmost branch in a week's time. So the pheasant's like, um, that doesn't sound, can't, can't be true. No, no, no. He said, give it a shot. The whole world survives on my dung, you know? I mean, just have a little bit of it and try it. Give it a shot. So the pheasant thinks about it. He says, I've heard of urine therapy. Maybe there's a dung therapy. Let me give it a shot. So he gingerly pecks on the, on the dung the first day. And sure enough, end of the day, he's on the first branch of the tree. So he gets damn excited. He's like, yes, this is it. So he eats dung every, the whole day for the whole week and reaches the topmost branch. I mean, he's flying sky high, and he's happy with himself. And he's seeing views he hasn't seen for many years, and he's sitting on the topmost branch. There's a farmer passing by. And he says, ah, look at that fat pheasant. Make me a good meal. Takes his gun out and shoots him down for a pheasant. <laughs> So a little bit of bullshit can get you a lot of places and make you fly high, but it won't let you stay there for too long. <laughs> <laughs> so on that note, let's fly to the Himalayas and cross the Himalayas and get into the Spiti Valley. Unfortunately, one still can't fly there, except on the wings of your imagination. The only way to get to Spiti is on a heart-wrenching, awe-inspiring, oh, the slide has to come here. Aim come. Cool. So that's Spiti Valley, and that's the road. So yeah, it is a heart-wrenching, nail-biting road to Spiti. And 10 hours from Manali, if you're lucky, and you don't come across a landslide like that. And for people who don't know where Spiti is, it's good. <laughs> it's right on the border of Tibet and Ladakh, and it shares similar landscape and cultures to both the neighbors, Tibet and Ladakh. It's got awesome landscape, diverse flora, fauna, a Buddhist community of little over 11,000 people living in villages that get off cut off for six months of the year, and that's why I come down. And it's a cold desert, and the main source of income is from agriculture, which is one crop a year, which is again very, very dependent on climate, and the erratic shifts in climate play havoc with it, so economies are completely dependent on the climate. So at Ecosphere, what we try and do is that we have a three-pronged approach. We work on looking at uh, conservation of the region's natural and cultural environment. We also look at how we can create alternate cash-based livelihoods for local communities. And then we look at how we can link the two to try and enable a more sustainable development of the region. So in simple language, we basically use money and economics as a means to an end, and the end basically being a more harmonious and a balanced development, which also values the environment and the cultural and the natural environment of the area. Um, it's heavy words, but and very, very difficult to achieve, especially in the current market economy where you know we value consumerism and competition, and there's very little space for things like cooperation and coexistence. Anyhow, that's a different debate altogether, and uh, so I'll cut the bullshit and get to what we do at Ecosphere. So we started 10 years ago and working in the Spiti Valley, and we started with the Wonderberry, which is a boon for the environment of the cold desert because it's soil binding, and so it prevents soil erosion, it fixes nitrogen, improves fertility of the soil. And Seabuckthorn, the more thorny name for this bush, for this berry, is uh, also a boon for one's health because it's packed with vitamins and minerals and, and you name it, all your omega oils. So it's antioxidant, and it's anti-aging, anti-cancer, anti-inflammation, anti-greed. <laughs> Sorry, it's not that. But apart from that, it's everything else. But uh, yeah, so we've at Ecosphere developed a bunch of products under the banner of setting. And setting, incidentally, means blessings for a long life. 
So the idea being when you consume sering, not only do you get blessed with the long life, but it also gives a long life for the ecology of the region. Ecosia then moved and shifted its journey to look at how we could look at the growing number of travelers coming into Spiti Valley. And because Spiti only opened up to the outside world about in the mid-90s, literally, even Indians going there needed permits. So we looked at the obvious, how could, you know, monies go down, more monies go down to local communities. We also looked at how the money being generated could look at addressing issues, conservation issues like fading cultural heritage or cultural knowledge and identity, how we could look at addressing human-wildlife conflicts through tourism, how could we could look at the rapidly de depleting geological heritage. And uh, so we developed various things. We developed homestays, we developed various trails, experiences. Uh, we developed ways of sharing traditional knowledge. We looked at uh, ways of life, how one could become, say, a monk and stay in the monastery. So different things and looking at how basically we could provide monies to local communities and hence a means, an incentive for them to look at valuing their own culture and also how they could, you know, an incentive to preserve it. And, and, and a, as a bonus, what really emerged was that anyone who traveled there and had a great experience, all these efforts were, were really, you know, provided a real insider's insight into Spiti. And uh, so, yeah, it was a great boon for travelers as well because they got a really good perspective and good experience while they traveled. But what was, but what does one do? Because, I mean, tourism, the inroads of tourism is inevitable. How do we weigh out the positives and the negatives and how do we ensure that the positives are more and the negatives can be reduced because you have the negatives of say garbage or carbon emissions every time you travel you emit carbon and uh, if the world was an ideal place and we were all conscious citizens we would look at how we could minimize garbage and not drink from a mineral water bottle or we <laughs> you know and uh, but we only live in ideals in our head if at all so at Ecosphere, what we decided was that we would um, ensure that all our trips were carbon neutral. And um, so what we do is we ensure that uh, not only are, are our trips low carbon, but also all the carbon that is emitted is calculated carefully and then it's offset without any cost to the traveler. We also uh, have a water refilling facility in our office in Spiti where a traveler can come and refill his bottle free of cost. And uh, the other thing which we try and do is we try and um, sensitize visitors, you know, to travel more responsibly. So that's one of the messages for travelers who go to monasteries. Don't wear clothes. Sorry. <laughs> Don't wear revealing clothes. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So basically what we try and do is give the traveler a choice. A choice to travel responsibly, a choice to directly and indirectly be a part of preserving the region that you travel to and leave as small a footprint as possible. Uh, yep. So that now brings me to what is the heart and soul of Ecosphere. It's our green energy initiatives and so any monies that we generate at Ecosphere we pump back into green energy and various other initiatives like environmental education which I'm not going to be able to touch upon because we don't have that much of time. But like Lydia just said, it's really, really cold in the winters. Right now, it's about minus 30 degrees up in Spiti Valley. So what, what we're experiencing now in Delhi is the summer back up in Spiti. So if anyone's feeling cold here, I hope that's some consolation. Uh, so, so to keep themselves warm, they burn a lot of fuel wood and dung in the winter months. And so that creates a lot of uh, carbon emissions apart from a lot of money that the local communities spend on just buying this fuel wood. Because everything has to come in from outside. It's a cold desert. And so what we try and do is we help communities make their houses what we call solar passive. So in simple language, that basically means that we try, uh, it, these houses help to absorb the sun's heat better and retain it longer. And as a result, then they've cut down 60% of fuel wood consumption, 2.5 tons of CO2 per annum, lots of saving on money, blah, blah, blah. And so what we, similar to that, what we try and do is we've developed solar bathing facilities. So they have the same benefits of, uh, reducing fuel wood consumption, carbon emissions, and also enhancing hygiene because then you don't have to freeze your butt off when you go have a bath at, in the freezing winters. Um, greenhouses is another one of our initiatives. No, green, growing green vegetables in Spiti is really difficult given the climate. So everything has to be brought in over kilometers and days, and so it's very expensive and, again, has a high carbon footprint. Mm. 
So what we do is using very simple, simple techniques, we develop what we call improved greenhouses, which are way simpler than the stuff that you see around out here in the cities. And uh, you can grow green vegetables till about minus 20 degrees in these. So you have access to vegetables throughout the year and a huge saving for the communities and we hope better nutritional intake. Now I get to our most ambitious project, which is about getting Spiti off the grid. Yeah, so <laughs> Spiti off the grid. And um, I lost my thought somewhere. Yeah, so it's Spiti's in Himachal, and one would think given all the hydroelectric power, there'd be surplus energy there. The government also claims it's 100% electri electrified, but uh, let me let, let you in on a secret. Governments claim a lot of stuff, but most of it is bullshit. <laughs> So what we try and do is we tap into the green energy, the abundant green energy available there, and uh, also trying to decentralize energy and make it community owned. So we recently uh, is solar, uh, electrified two villages up in Spiti, and this is one of the villages, it was solar electrified. And incidentally, the highest village in Asia, Comic, is now generating its own electricity through a solar wind and a pedal generator hybrid. <laughs> yeah. Over the years, we had a lot of travelers coming back to us and saying, we really want to give back something. And I mean, I really appreciate the amazing people and a rare breed though, but really amazing. So we tried and because when you go on a holiday, I mean, it's all about yourself. It's all about enjoying yourself. And you know, even though a place gives back so much to you. So we developed various ways in which um, travelers could give back, you know, their time, their skills. And again, as a bonus, it was amazing because you know you develop these volunteers develop like lifelong relationships with the place, and uh, you know memories that they'll cherish for the rest of their lives. I just got an email from one of our first volunteers who said that uh, you know Spiti's been imprinted on her life forever, and she just can't wait to come back. <laughs> so I mean. 10 years and we've had a bunch of experiences, some good, some not so good, you know, but stuff that you can learn from. So I'd just like to share some two learnings that I've had over the past 10 years. And one of them has, has been that, you know, there are lots of people the world over doing a bunch of amazing stuff. And I mean, TEDx is a great platform for that. And uh, we all would want to do stuff like that. You know, there's a bunch of us who sit back and say, yeah, this is amazing, you know, but I have A, B, C, D responsibilities. But somewhere I feel, you know, I mean, we can't become like these people, you know, we can't dedicate our lives doing stuff. But we need to stop being an audience. We need to do, you can't change the world, but you can change yourself, you know, and uh, you can change the way you think, the way your, your lives, you can change uh, the way you travel, what you eat, what you buy, how much you give, how much you share. You know, and if everyone started changing a little bit about themselves, the whole world would eventually change, hopefully. <laughs> the other learning is money, money, money. Money rules the world, right? And that makes the world go around. But money is a means to an end. It's not the end. But what we've done is we've got confused somewhere along the way. We've made the means the end, and we've made ourselves the slaves to it. Uh, I just feel that... Um, you know, economics is a great tool to make people do things, but uh, we need to realize that it has its limitations. It does feed on human greed, and human greed feeds on the limited resources of the earth. Like Gandhi once said, that you know, there's enough for everyone's need, but there's not enough for anybody's greed, right? So can we differentiate between our needs and our desires? You know, uh, there's some stats that I read somewhere about, uh, if we were to live like a US citizen, sorry America, you come in everywhere, but uh, we need four and a half planets. Even if that's exaggerated a bit, you know, give it the benefit of the doubt. We know quite obviously that there's not enough for the ever-growing population of the human virus, is what I call it, or its ever-growing aspirations. So, I mean, what are we? Are we stupid or are we blind? You know, that we can't see this illusion that shrouds us. So, I mean, you know, we really need to do something, and we do need to do something now, you know? So, make a choice. The balls in our court. I'd just like to end with a few words that have had a huge meaning for us at Ecosphere, and that uh, it's by one of the founders of Ecosphere. Age of man blessed by death. Life of desires leads to another birth. To sacrifice the times for Mother Earth is to rise above this life of misery and mirth. Thank you.